Hi. <laughs> oh, it's good to see you all here. Uh, my name's Heather. I wanted to start my presentation um, this morning by asking you to reflect on two central questions. The first is, what are the places that have influenced who you are? And the second is, what is special about the places that you choose as your own? I work for Penrith... Uh, <laughs> I work for Penrith City Council's Neighbourhood Renewal Program. Um, and to start my presentation today, I wanted to um, show you a couple of maps. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. Um, <clears throat> Penrith is 54 kilometres west from the Sydney CBD. Uh, it's about 400 square kilometres, which is pretty, pretty big. Um, and it's considered to be regional. There are 178,000 people living in Penrith. It's surrounded by several other LGAs, as LGAs tend to be surrounded, um, including uh, the Hawkesbury to the north, uh, the Blue Mountains to the west, Blacktown including Mount Druitt, which is where I was brought up, and uh, Fairfield and Liverpool to the south. This is cool. It gets really like big and takes over the whole world. <laughs> There are 11 suburbs um, in the Penrith a uh, LGA, which according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics are considered to be comparatively disadvantaged. These are older established neighbourhoods and some of them are rural uh, and they have not benefited from the, the new developments, the big new developments across Penrith City. These are the neighbourhoods in which the Penrith Neighbourhood Renewal Program operates. Our approach is about participation and placemaking. We work together to develop neighbourhood action plans with the residents, which reflect the stories residents tell us about what is good and strong in their neighbourhood, as well as the things that need improving. This might include physical infrastructure projects like the redevelopment of a, a children's park. Um, it might be the development of new social programs or social enterprises. The important thing is that the residents set the priorities and that they have a say in what happens in their neighbourhood. We also support placemaking through um, our Magnetic Places Community Cultural Grants Program. Um, and this funds artists and community services to run small placemaking programs within the neighbourhood renewal areas. And this brings me to acknowledging my team because I, I feel a bit naff today presenting on my own because really our work is totally um, a group, a team effort and they all bring their own passion for Western Sydney to the table. So I wanted to acknowledge Callie Van Dyke Dunleavy, who's not here, Angelie Roberts, who is here, and Stephanie Adam, who is here, and Jenny Pollard, our fierce manager, who wasn't able to be here today. I have this really personal connection to Western Sydney. I, I kind of wear it a bit like a, a badge of honour. I grew up in a three bedroom, converted to four bedroom, big deal, <laughs> fibro home in Mount Druitt. Um, it was painted a kind of off-white colour and I, for some reason Dad painted all the trimmings in Mission Brown. Um, we had this enormous backyard and a big veggie patch and a huge tree that my brothers and I just were hardly ever out of, unless we were out the front riding our bikes or playing footy with the neighbourhood kids. So if you can imagine a tiny tomboy with a red mullet, a BMX bike that was second hand and surrounded by boys, you've got a pretty good vision of who I was. The rules were that we had to stay on the block between Carlisle Avenue and Luxford Road and we had to be home before the streetlights came on. I attended Mount Druitt Public School and Wayland High School before my parents decided that we needed to move to somewhere better. My brothers and I, in true adolescent form, were completely devastated. We didn't want to leave our neighbourhood or our friends and I really liked my school. About a month before we finally moved, I was awarded Year 7 Person of the Year. <laughs> and, yeah, it's one of my biggest achievements. And I thought I was really cool. And my brothers pretty quickly informed me that actually that's a try-hard award. <laughs> it's the award for the kid who tried really super hard at everything and didn't win anything. <laughs> 
So we moved to Hazelbrook, which is in the middle of the Blue Mountains, and we were sent to school at Blacksland, at the base of the Blue Mountains, because that was considered to be a better public school. On my first day at Blacksland High, I have this really clear memory. Mum had done all the, all the paperwork and signed us in, and I was escorted down by a student to um, a demountable classroom. I have this kind of clear vision of it and it kind of comes with that classroom smell. Sometimes when I walk into classrooms now in this job I, I feel like I'm there, you know. <laughs> and it had this kind of dark green carpet and these neat little clusters of yellow tables with very little graffiti on them. And the teacher, he pointed down to the back of the classroom and he asked me to sit at a spare chair with two boys, Adrian and Glenn. So I go down and I sit down and the first thing that happens is Glenn says, what school did you come from? <laughs> and I say, Whalen High. And he says, where's Whalen? And I say, it's in Mount Druitt. And that was the moment that I realised that there's stigma associated with place. It was the first time I realised that being from Mount Druitt was meant to be bad. I became Mount Druitt Girl because the boys constantly referred to me as Mount Druitt Girl. And I'm pretty sure that neither of them knew my actual name until years later when Adrian's sister Simone married my brother Derek. <laughs> and now we're part of an extended family and I rib him a lot about that. <laughs> he says he doesn't remember but I think he's... <laughs> I think he's lying. It was a matter of two weeks at that school before there was a rumour that uh, Mount Druitt girl and the only non-Anglo girl in our year, Jacinta, were going to have this huge biff on the oval and neither of us knew anything about it at all. <laughs> and I definitely didn't want to have a biff with Jacinta because she was at least a foot taller than me and she didn't really want to have a fight with someone from Mount Druitt. I guess it's funny because I think I became Mount Druitt girl. It is weird that you're over there. It's like this little posse in the corner. It, I think it's funny I became Mount Druitt girl for a little while because I, I kind of embodied it. I tried to be harder and badder than I was. I have this clear memory of my brothers teasing me because we're walking home from the train and I was trying to kind of do this tough walk. And I was thinking about it like, what do you look like if you're tough? Like, and I was doing this thing. And, <laughs> Um, and, and they teased me about it and I would make up stories about how tough I was, things that I was still doing in Mount Druitt, which I wasn't really doing because I wasn't really <laughs> visiting Mount Druitt. But uh, I guess eventually at that school I made friends. I got involved in drama and did some things and um, my experience wasn't altogether terrible at Blacksland High. But I didn't perform as well as I had at school in Mount Druitt or at Whalen. And I was certainly never again the recipient of any try-hard awards. <laughs> so much of our identity is about place. We often let people know where, where we grew up, even when we no longer live there, because it informs them about who we are, who we have been, where we've come from. I often refer to myself still as a Mount Druitt girl, but the reality is I haven't lived in Mount Druitt for nearly 20 years. I think this is why I'm so passionate about place and about Western Sydney in particular. I've lived in other places, but I always come back to Western Sydney. And in some ways, this job for me is a lot like coming home. I now have the great honour of working in neighbourhoods which are much like the one I grew up in. So each year, my team focuses on two of our neighbourhood renewal areas, our 11 areas. And in the past year, we've been focused on Colleton, which you can see just down the, the bottom. It's the closest one to me. And funnily enough, I always thought that Colleton was a suburb of Mount Druitt, but it's in the Penrith LGA. We, ran a, we run a series of events and creative community development programs and stock standard consultations, things to get people talking to us. But in the past year, we've been focused on Colleton, and as part of that, we, at that engagement program, we ran two family fun days at a local park. Now, these events really, they, they cost under $1,000. They're targeted at um, 
families with very young children. They happen in a park with not a lot in it. And you might have a jumping castle of free sausage sizzle and some fruit and maybe a face painter. So as we're setting up the first of these events in Colleton, this group of young men come walking through the park. There's two older boys, a 17-year-old and an 18-year-old, and they're followed by a group of primary school boys. They all had the kind of tough swagger going on and one of them didn't have his shirt on. And it became really clear to me that we're setting up our dorky kids event in their park. <laughs> so I approached them and I interviewed them as a group and the conversation centred on a recent murder that had happened just across the road and uh, also how hardcore the boys are. <laughs> it's really interesting to me that in every neighbourhood I work in, the very first thing that residents tell me about, especially kids, children and young people, they tell you about the most horrible thing that, that they know about that place. In this case, a woman had been stabbed to death by her partner in a domestic violence incident, which we all know is not only happening in Colleton. In other communities, it might be a shooting that happened 10 years ago or a traffic accident in which a local young person was killed. These are the stories that creep forward with very little prompting from me. Once the interview was over, our Colleton boys asked me if they could hang around and have a sausage sandwich. And I say, sure, but it's not going to be ready for a while. We're still setting up. So they hang around, they talk with other staff, they hovered around Angeli quite a bit that day. They were doing stuff with our map, they're drawing places, things that happen on Colleton all over the map, talking to people. When the face painter arrives, they all have their faces painted, starting with the two older boys as ghouls. <laughs> ghouls. So this kind of this Halloween scene going on. These really tough boys, they have a sausage sandwich and they stayed with us for three hours <laughs> at this kids' event at a park with their faces painted. They're talking about AKs and drugs and police chases and fights in the park and constantly telling us how hardcore they are. I can hardly imagine a scenario in which I was scared of any of those boys. <laughs> they were sweet and fun and funny but they define themselves as hardcore because they live in Colleton. And it's become part of their identity, something they actively try to embody. And it's now something that those older boys are teaching those young boys. At the second family fun day, um, we, uh, an elderly woman was escorted down to have a sausage sandwich with her son's friend. Um, I interviewed her and I was really happy to find out that the park we were in is named after her late husband, Kevin Maley. And Mrs Maley told me a few stories about Kevin that day and she did it with immense pride. And it left me wondering why those aren't the stories that we take on and retell. I wanted to share two things with you today um, that are kind of personal development reflections. The first is that when I began my time in the Penrith Neighbourhood Renewal Program, I honestly, I believed that real change and real placemaking were about really practical things. I believed that the most transforming work I could do would be to make sure that people have a say, to have access to education and employment and social connection and an improved physical environment. I thought cultural programs were this great added bonus but I don't think I believed that they could create real change. But the stories people tell about a place and the stigma or the pride associated with those stories is really very powerful. These stories are really now very important to me because they're really important to the communities I serve. They inform parts of who they are, how they feel about themselves and how they perceive others. Although our program is funded to address disadvantage, we take a strengths perspective. And our manager, Jenny Pollard, who's a Richmond girl, has always been very strong on this. Working in a place model rather than a welfare model allows us um, to look at a whole community, at all of its strengths and all of its disadvantages. So this is the unique aspect of our program. The stories gathered through community cultural development inform the renewal of the physical and the social environment. The stories inform practical change. 
This brings me to my second learning. I wonder if you recall, if you remember a character called Big Kev. He, um, he was kind of like an overweight Anglo guy, red-faced, um, like me, but a bit older and male. And, uh, and he used to sell cleaning, a line of cleaning products with the catchphrase, I'm excited, in these really obnoxious television ads. He died in 2005 of a heart attack. I tend to have this kind of big Kev element of my personality in that I get really excited, I get really enthusiastic to tell the positive story and sometimes I forget that the residents might not be feeling it. A resident pulled me up on this recently and I, I re realised in my enthusiasm for the strengths perspective that I'd started to silence just some of the stories that were important to the residents. So I guess it's a balance between telling enough stories about a place that you honour the things that people are telling you are not good, as well as the things people are telling you are great. If the only story being told about a place is a shooting that happened 10 years ago, then that's a problem because it means no other stories are being told. A murder in Colleton should not define it. Disadvantage shouldn't define it. But neither is life in Colleton all roses and sunshine. So to conclude my part in today's stories, I wanted to invite you all to come out to Penrith sometime. We'll give you a tour around the place and maybe talk about some of the projects we're working on. We're always looking for creative, energetic people to work with. Sometimes I drive past our old house, number 10 Chester Street in Mount Druitt. And I have so many stories about that place, the cluster of spitfires that gathered on the tree out the front every spring, the day mum put a pitchfork through a big toe in the veggie patch, and the day I was awarded Year 7 Person of the Year. <laughs> and of course I have some bad stories. I hope to hear many more stories of place today, stories of strength and resilience, and I hope as you reflected on those central questions I asked at the beginning, that some really fond memories have emerged for you and that you share them with others as often as you can. Thank you.